uh, this morning, the last day of the summer school, but it promises to be uh, quite the event here. So uh, I'm very pleased to, to, to we have, a, we're switching lecturers for our turbulent combustion course. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, today's lecturer, Professor uh, Sweto Promachowdery, although we always just call him Sweto. So this is always the awkwardness of making introductions is using the formal uh, titles. So uh, Professor Chowdhury is an uh, associate professor at the University of Toronto in their Institute for Aerospace um, Studies. Before that, he was a professor at the Indian Institute of Science, um, was at Princeton for some time uh, before that, uh, after which he got his PhD at uh, the University of Connecticut. And so I think it's a really great uh, synergy with uh, who you've heard from from the last four days, Professor Mastarakos, because like Professor Mastarakos, Professor Chowdhury is someone who does not only experiments, but also some computation in theory. And so he brings a very broad perspective on the topic of, of turbulent combustion um, that he is going to be sharing with you uh, today. And so I think, it, again, it's, it's a true treat to have him here. And I will turn the floor over to him uh, to start his lecture. So, Sweto. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for the very kind uh, introduction and the, for the very kind invitation. Uh, thank you very much to you and Professor Law and uh, Saha for organizing this uh, really uh, great uh, summer school. Uh, so, uh, uh, let's move into the slides. I hope you can see the slides. Yes, we can. And, great. So, uh, we'll begin. Uh, the title of today's talk is uh, Structure and Propagation of Turbulent Primix Flames. And if time permits, we'll talk a little bit about stabilization also, but we'll see how we go. Uh, we'd like to make it uh, interactive. That is, if you have questions as we proceed forward with the material, please feel free to ask them. And uh, we'd like to discuss things, whatever question pops in your mind, and then try to address them, and then we'll try to move ahead. That's how I believe it can be fruitful for, for both uh, you as well as uh, for me in delivering this lecture. So, okay. Uh, so structure and propagation of turbulent primix flames. Before we delve into the detailed technicalities, uh, here is the outline. So first, uh, we're going to look into the, the introduction, introduce the topic, uh, followed by a discussion on the regime diagrams, the classical regime diagrams that many of you are aware of, as well as some of the new developments that has taken place. Then we are going to look into the evolution of uh, flame surfaces in moderate turbulence, uh, followed by local flame speed and structure in moderate as well as in intense turbulence. So this is all about local description of the, of the turbulent from its flame, how the local flame speed evolves. And then we are going to move into more global description how the, the flame globally propagates, how, how we can describe the statistical propagation of the turbulent primix flame, and followed by uh, turbulence uh, Darius Landau instability interaction that is based on the exponents on the global propagation speed, on the scaling exponents of the global propagation speed, how we can distinguish between different regimes of flame propagation which is dominated purely by turbulence as well as dominated purely by various instability, instability and as well as their interaction. So this is the overall, overall uh, scheme of things. And as I said that uh, in, the, in the flyer, of course, there is the stabilization also, but I don't know whether uh, this will take up the, uh, the full uh, three hours. Uh, if we have time, we'll go into flame stabilization too. But it's not uh, necessary that we cover everything that is in the slides. Okay. So before we uh, go into the detail of the formulations and etc., let's just pause a moment and uh, behold the three uh, faces of the turbulent primix or the, of the primix flame. Okay. The three uh, distinct uh, characters that a primix flame presents depending on the environment in which it propagates. As you can see, the top row shows a uh, smooth spherical laminar flame propagating in a quiescent environment. All three of them are basically ignited from the point source. And the surrounding is, of course, a premix reactance, 
or in the top row, there is no perturbation in the flow. It's a, it's a quiescent, uh, stagnant flow. And as you ignite the, the reactant from this point source, uh, from these, uh, between these two electrodes, from the gap between these two electrodes, the premix flame propagates smoothly uh, and it expands uh, spherically. Okay. Now, uh, this, this propagation rate, if you see, is, is, is essentially can be mildly nonlinear based on the stretch effects. Okay, uh, but it's very mildly nonlinear. And this 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 uh, configuration has been very useful in extracting the very important and fundamental quantity that is the planar laminar flame speed, and which has been used for mechanism uh, validation, mechanism reduction, so on and so forth. But if the radius to the flame thickness ratio grows above certain certain threshold, uh, then what happens? The flame becomes unstable. Okay. And it becomes characterized by, uh, by, by different structures, different cellular structures, and is, is a manifestation. The cellular structures is a manifestation of the well-known hydrodynamic instability called the Darius Landau instability. And this has, this of course propagates on average much faster than the corresponding laminar counterpart. Okay, but is this the fastest way that the flame can propagate? No, the answer is, the fastest a flame can propagate is when the surroundings is also is, is turbulent, when the surrounding flow is turbulent. So in this fan generated nearly isotropic turbulent conditions, the flame is, is propagating much faster than these uh, than any of these previous two configurations. So this is a, is a, is a fully turbulent flame propagating uh, uh, at a very, um, it's, it's essentially a self accelerating uh, flame um, that propagates into the into the turbulent uh, reactants uh, that is in this in its surroundings. So, uh, but what I, the reason why we put all these three together in the same photograph is that uh, to know and understand this, this most complex uh, flame of these three uh, configurations that is a turbulent flame is, is that you have to know a lot about uh, the laminar flame propagation, its laminar flame structures also. So it does not mean that in the turbulent condition, your laminar flame structure is preserved, but without the insights that you develop from, from understanding the laminar flame structure, it's really hard to comprehend what happens in a, in a turbulent flame propagation. So you have to know the laminar flame structure, laminar flame propagation very well, and then you have to connect it with the turbulent physics and, the, and something new can emerge out of the interaction of the, of the, of the, of the flame structure with the turbulence. Okay, but you basically rest your your understanding or 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 your development uh, of understanding on these two pillars of laminar flame propagation as well as turbulence physics, and and expect that something new emerges when the when the flame interacts with turbulence, and you based on those knowledges you try to explain the new physics that will that will emerge. Okay, so uh, with that uh, we'll uh, proceed. Uh, now, turbulent premix flames. Uh, why should we learn about turbulent premix flames? Uh, because, uh, of course, it's a it's a very fascinating phenomena. It is rich in dynamics, but also it is ubiquitous in the natural and the, in the engineered world. Okay, you find turbulent premix combustion inside the inside the spark ignition engine. It drives a crankshaft, uh, and you can find it in gas turbine engines. Now, aircraft engines has been has been uh, predominantly using non-premix spray flames uh, for, for, a long, for a long time. But recently uh, with the advent of the GE TAPS combustor, a large part of the flame is becoming premixed inside combustors. And now the Rolls-Royce is, uh, is also proceeding towards utilizing more and more uh, premix flames inside their combustor. So the tendency, the trend is to, is to make flames more premix even in aircraft gas turbine engines, okay? And of course, stationary power plants, uh, uh, stationary gas turbine power plants have used uh, premix flames for, uh, for uh, quite a while in their dry, low NOx combustors. You can find premix flames in industrial gas burners. Now, all these three examples uh, that you find are essentially drivers of of uh, civilization, it, it uh, drives uh, cars, aircrafts, uh, makes powers, also wonderful things. 
Okay, but uh, there can be disastrous effects of premix flames also. You can have a vapor cloud explosion where a premix flame can transition from this deflagration state to a to its detonation that is an explosion state. I am sure you have heard about it a great deal in the in Professor Clavin's lectures. So uh, that is also a manifestation of the other side of a premix flame. That is, uh, it can lead to really great uh, loss of uh, life and property unless you are careful about it in handling it, and there can be accidents. But uh, at the same time, it's also fascinating to recognize that uh, probably we owe our existence to uh, one such explosive premix flame, okay? Uh, that is a supernova 1A is essentially, uh, uh, is essentially caused by uh, a premix flame of carbon ox oxygen uh, mixtures uh, transitioning from deflagration to detonation, okay? And uh, it is fascinating because uh, all the heavy elements that are cooked up inside these uh, these dead stars, I mean, these get disseminated into the universe, and they find all the way into our bloodstreams and into our uh, into the into different uh, you know in all over the universe because of these kind of explosions. If these explosions that is that is triggered by deflagration detonation did not happen, these heavy elements would not have been uh, found throughout the universe. So we can say that, I mean, we owe our existence also to this uh, rich and complex dynamics of these uh, primitive flames. So it's, it's definitely a thing that is worthwhile to understand and to conduct research on. Okay, so this was uh, this uh, primitive flame in an industrial application in a G-TAPS combustor. You see the uh, uh, primitive flame uh, stabilized uh, by uh, soil imparted uh, through with the different kind of swallows and flame stabilizers. Okay, and how does turbulence interact with, uh, with the flame? So what we have done here is that we have extracted one of the surfaces inside, from inside the premix flame structure. And uh, we have tried to visualize uh, how different vortices uh, uh, impinge and interact on the flame and what kind of uh, dynamics evolve. So you can see that this once uh, planar flame uh, now is interacted with these different vertical structures and then the stretch, fold, wrinkle, uh, this, uh, the flame surface and then they uh, annihilate the flame surfaces also in these training edges. Okay, so it's a, it's a complex interplay, interplay between, uh, between turbulence and flame propagation that is resulting in this kind of uh, uh, complex interaction. And the, a large part of this talk will be dedicated towards essentially understanding this kind of interactions and the manifestation of these kind of interactions on the most important property of the flame, that is its propagation speed. Okay, so we will look into in great details how the propagation speed evolves locally, how the propagation speed evolves globally as a result of this kind of multi scale interaction between the turbulence and this diffusive reactive surface of the flame stream. Okay. So first, uh, let's talk about uh, regime diagrams. <clears throat> you might already know uh, some uh, 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 many many uh, things about it, uh, but we'll still recap these, and uh, because we need to use it uh, to, to basically show what what configurations of the, of the different. What are the configurations of the different flame states we are talking about? Okay, so what are the essence of the regime diagrams? Where does it evolve from? Okay, this essentially captures the comparison of the characteristic length scales and time scales in a turbulent flow with the corresponding scales of the chemical reaction or that of the lapinar flame. Okay, now the comparison of the scales helps in assessing whether the lapinar flame structure can exist in a turbulent flow or not. At what regimes that we can expect the laminar structure to exist, at what regimes we'll expect significant deviations from the corresponding laminar flame structure. So what are the length scales and time scales of a laminar flame? The length scale is of course the flame thickness and which we can define as the ratio of the thermal diffusivity to the unstretched planar laminar flame speed SL. Okay. And correspondingly, we can find out the local time scale, which we can define as the thermal diffusivity divided by the unstretched planar laminar flame speed squared. Now, that is, so that is 
we can easily find out the length and time scales of the laminar flame. In turbulent flow, of course, you have a continuum of length scales starting from the integral scales, uh, uh, from the large scales to the integral scales to the Kolmogorov uh, length scale. Uh, and so you can define different uh, length scales in a turbulent flow. So, so if we assume that the Schmidt number and Prandtl number are unity, which is essentially the uh, very basic assumption of the, of the regime diagram, uh, you have to also recognize that these regime diagrams that are defined are only tentative and not to be take this, taken as strict, uh, strict boundaries. Okay? These different lines that separate different regimes, they're not strict boundaries. So uh, first we have to obtain some non-dimensional numbers that can, be, uh, that can be utilized for comparing the length scales and time scales of turbulence and the line flame. And this will help us in marking the different regimes of the regime diagram. So once again, uh, as a consequence of the Schmidt number, Prandtl number equal to one, uh, we can write that the kinematic viscosity is equal to molecular diffusivity is equal to thermal diffusivity. And as a result, we can write alpha is equal to kinematic viscosity is equal to your uh, flame thickness times the flame speed. Okay, And as a result, we can define the large scale Reynolds number as this URMS velocity times the integral length scale divided by your flame thickness times the flame speed. Okay, now one important thing about the regime diagram is, of course, you invoke the properties of homogeneous isotropic non reacting turbulence. Okay, the regime diagram builds on one hand, it takes into account the planar laminar flame properties, and on the other hand, it takes into account the properties that we know are, are true from homogeneous isotropic turbulence. And those properties essentially stems from Kolmogorov's first similarity hypothesis, in which uh, which states that in every turbulent flow at sufficiently high Reynolds number, the statistics of small scale motion have a universal form that is uniquely determined by kinematic viscosity and turbulent kinetic energy dissipation rate. Okay, small scales are determined by kinematic viscosity and turbulent kinetic energy dissipation rate. Not small scales, that is the intermediate scales that comes from the second similarity hypothesis, intermediate scales between the energy containing range and far away from the Kolmogorov length scale have a universal form that is uniquely determined by turbulent kinetic energy dissipation rate alone and independent of kinematic viscosity. Okay. And that is why it is called the inertial range. It's, it doesn't know anything about friction. Okay. So utilizing the first one, essentially we can, uh, if we define a turbulent Karlovitz number as the ratio of the flame time scale to the Kolmogorov time scale, and then using the fact that your Reynolds number at the Kolmogorov length scale is equal to one. Now, this is a consequence of Kolmogorov's first similarity hypothesis, that is your Re eta is equal to one. And then using this, we can define Karlovitz number. We can obtain from this definition of Karlovitz number in terms of the time scale ratio, we can obtain a Karlovitz number in terms of the length scale ratio and we find that it is essentially the ratio of the flame thickness to the Kolmogorov length scale, whole scale. Whereas this flame thickness is the preheat zone thickness. Now we can also define a reaction Kolmogorov number where the length scale here is defined based on the uh, reaction zone thickness. And you know that the reaction zone thickness and, and the, the preheat zone thickness and the reaction zone thickness, that's of the order of Zeldovich number. That comes from the uh, premixed uh, standard laminar premixed flame analysis. And of course, using your uh, scale separation ratio, that is the ratio of your Kolmogorov length scale to the integral length scale, scales as Reynolds number to the minus three by four. And utilizing this, we can define, we can find out that Kolmogorov number square scale, scales is, is equal to the ratio of your integral length scale by flame thickness to the power minus one times the URMS. Uh, the, the RMS of velocity fluctuations divided by the uh, unstretched planar laminar flame speed Q. So you can clearly see that there are two non-dimensional groups that have emerged, one in terms of the velocity or the, or the speed ratio and another in terms of the length scale ratio that has that basically forms uh, this Karlovitz number. Now we can also define a Tamkula number as the ratio of the the, uh, the integral time scale to the, the flame time scale uh, or the flame crossing time scale. And then utilizing this, these uh, relations, we can show that your dumb column number also can be written in terms of these non-dimensional uh, 
parameters, the length scale ratio and the uh, speed ratios. URMS, RMS of velocity fluctuations divided by flame speed to the power minus one. Now, what are the implications or what are the interpretations of Karlovitz number and Dan Coulomb number? The Karlovitz number helps in assessing the interaction of the small scales of turbulence of, uh, with the flame. Okay. If, if it is much less than one, it means that the flame time scales are much, much smaller than the Kolmogorov time scales in turbulence. And it is difficult for the small scales of the flow to disturb the flame structure. Whereas if Kolmogorov's number is much, much greater than one, it means that the flame time scales are larger than the Kolmogorov time scales and the small scales of turbulence can distort the flame structure. What about Amkola number greater than one? Tom greater number greater than one means the flame time scales are smaller than the large time scales in turbulence, and it is difficult for the large scales to distort the flame structure. And vice versa for Tom number less than one. So Karlovitz number helps in assessing the interaction of small scales of turbulence with the flame. Tom number helps in assessing the interaction of large scales of the turbulence with the flame. So with this, now if you just recall that these are the length scale ratios and the, and the velocity scale ratios that we have formed, to define Kolmogorov number and Damkola number, then we can also draw this iso Kolmogorov number and iso Damkola number line in a diagram, which is which is which axis the axis of which are basically composed of these non-dimensional parameters. Okay, so our regime diagram essentially is defined with this length scale ratio on the x-axis, the ratio of the integral length scale to the flame thickness on the x-axis and uh, the RMS of velocity fluctuations and uh, divided by unstretched panel, I mean, of flame speed on the y-axis. And in this log log plot, we can draw this iso number line where the Kolmogorov number equal to one based on the phase zone thickness, and it has a slope of one by three. And the reaction Kolmogorov number is also here, it has also a slope of one by three. And there is a Reynolds number line because Reynolds number is essentially the product of this and this. So it has a slope of minus one. And based on these essentially three lines, uh, as well as this, this line, which is essentially the ratio of U prime by SL, we can show, uh, we, can, we can draw the regime diagram. So anything less than this, we can say that this is a laminar, laminar regime. Okay, uh, U prime by SL greater than, less than one, but length scale ratio reasonably large. These are essentially wrinkle flamelets. We'll later see that this is, for their physical significance. Uh, U prime by SL greater than one, but still your preheat zone thickness smaller than your Kolmogorov length scale. The local flame just behaves like a perturbed laminar flame. So this is called the corrugated flamelet. But if your preheat zone thickness is greater than the Kolmogorov length scale, then the Kolmogorov number becomes greater than one. And we can we expect that the small scale eddies of turbulence can, has essentially distorted the flame structure, uh, whereas the reaction is intact. And that is why it is called the reaction shape limit or the thin reactions in regime. Okay. Uh, whereas uh, this regime, where your uh, Kolmogorov uh, length scale is smaller than the reaction zone thickness, this is here, we expect the reaction zone to be distorted and distributed. And that's why we expect this to behave as a well stirred reactor. Okay, so this is the regime diagram that has essentially been proposed by Borgi and Peters. There are other versions of it uh, that has been proposed by Williams, uh, uh, which is based on uh, the, the axis being your uh, Reynolds number, Tom Cullen number also. And uh, there are recent measurements that question some of the validity of this regime diagrams. Okay, but we'll go into that in due time when we talk about intense, intensely turbulent flames. So uh, when we talk about moderate turbulent, we'll essentially talk about this regime. Okay, that is Kolmogorov's number less than order 10, around of the order 10 to less than order 10. When we talk about intense turbulence, we talk about Kolmogorov's number of the order of 100, 000, 100 to 1000. Okay, that is in this region. So uh, this is the nomenclature for moderate turbulence and the intense turbulence, intense turbulent flames and moderate turbulent flames that we're going to use in this, in this lecture. Okay, 
So this is uh, essentially what we just discussed, uh, ring two flame limit regime, when that happens, when the U prime bias are less than one. Okay, but Reynolds are greater than one. How do we get flame limit regimes when U prime bias cell is greater than one? Reynolds are greater than one. We expect the flame structure to be just uh, pushed around by turbulence eddies. And uh, then the reaction sheet limit, your Kolovitz number is, uh, uh, sorry, this Kolovitz number should be greater than one. Your reaction Kolovitz number is less than one. Okay, and uh, this is the uh, where we expect the the flame to distort uh, the, the 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 flame to be distorted by uh, small scale uh, eddies. And in the well stirred reaction reaction regime, uh, well stirred reaction regime, your your Reynolds number of course is much greater than one, and your reaction Kolovitz is greater than one. Okay. So uh, that's about uh, the proposed regime diagrams. We'll reflect on this in terms of recent measurements by Driscoll's group uh, about whether these are correct, not where deviations can occur, cannot occur. Uh, and we'll also uh, discuss a few issues uh, of that. Uh, but if you have any questions of this material up to this point, uh, please feel free to ask. I'll be happy to discuss. Okay, all right. So should we proceed to the next part? Okay, good. So, uh, Vishnu, you can hear me, right? I can, I can. Sorry? Professor, can you tell once again? You, you can uh, hear me, right? I can, I can. Okay, okay good. Fine. Yeah, you see, uh, that is the issues about uh, online lecturing, right? I mean, sometimes if there is disconnected, uh, we get disconnected or something, there's, I have no way of knowing what's happening. Um, can you comment on how the reaction rates are heat release in these regimes? Yeah, we will we will uh, we'll discuss this uh, to some extent in the in the later uh, slides. Of course, in this regime, uh, uh, yeah. Of course, in these regimes, uh, you will expect uh, your reaction rates and heat release rate to be uh, similar to that of uh, that of that of laminar flames. In the in the reaction sheet regime, also it, it is uh, it is to some extent uh, similar, but there the transport is affected by turbulence. And uh, well, in the reaction in this well stirred reactor regime, uh, it it. Uh, it can be uh, it can be different, but recent research shows that it is also strongly. It's not like universal for all fuels that the whether how far the heat release rates and the reaction rates will be affected also can be fuel specific. Okay, because the fuels uh, the premix flame structure the internal structure of the premix flame and the location of the heat release rate, the location of the fuel consumption. Uh, depends on the fuel structure itself. Okay, so those have important bearings on uh, how far your heat release rate and, and fuel consumption rate will be affected depending on the regimes. Okay. All right. So uh, next part, we're going to look into this topic of genesis and evolution of premix flames in moderate turbulence. All right. You can uh, see my uh, full screen, right? Yes, Rosa. Good. Thanks, Vishnu. So, uh, so laminar and turbulent uh, premix flames. Of course, the objective is to understand. Uh, uh, turbulent premix flames, 
but how do you analyze the turbulence flame interaction, uh, the interaction of turbulence with uh, premix flame? Let's take a look into the standard premix flame structure. A standard premix flame is a planar, laminar, unstretched flame in a double infinite domain. Okay. So it has a finite temperature, it has a finite temperature gradient. Uh, and uh, it has a heat release rate. Now this is a hydrogen air premix flame. So the heat release rate peaks at a, at a, at a reasonably low temperatures because uh, it's primarily dominated, it's primarily controlled by the, by the, by the three body termination reaction, uh, which has got zero activation energy. So it, is, it peaks at about temperature of about 800 Kelvin, the heat release rate. But uh, so it has a, got a unique, unique characteristics for hydrogen flames. But nevertheless, uh, the way one way we can analyze uh, uh, turbulence flame interaction is that if we can slice up this region of finite temperature gradient into several slices, into several uh, iso temperature surfaces. Okay, so you can think that a, a, a standard laminar premix flame is like a book, and these slices represent the different pages of the book. Okay, and as turbulence impinges and passes through these pages, these pages will get distorted and stretched and wrinkled. And if we can analyze individual pages one at a time, we can, and then we can form a collective idea of what's happening for all these pages. Uh, we can understand uh, how essentially has turbulence has interacted through the entire flame. Okay. So this is one of those pages. This is one of those isotherms that has been extracted from uh, uh, this structure and we are trying to visualize uh, how turbulence is interacting with this flame. Okay. So uh, what do you see here? We see that the initially planar flame uh, is being stretched. Of course, it's being stretched because in the same uh, cross-section area, this uh, the final surface of the, of the, of the later time surface is much more convoluted than its initial planar surface. So it's stretched. Okay, so it's stretched, it's wrinkled, it's folded. Okay, there can be multiple folds. And also you see that at the trailing edge, the flame surface is being continuously annihilated. Okay, it's just, uh, it's, it essentially collides with itself to self annihilate. So uh, if this structure is statistically stationary, okay, and if this is continuously being annihilated, then it means that it is also being continuously generated. Okay. So with that question or with that observation that it must be continuously generated to support continuous annihilation, we can ask the question that where is this surface being generated from? Where is it generated? How is it generated by turbulence? Okay. So turbulent frame surfaces are continuously generated and annihilated. The exact locations of a surface that generate the complete new surfaces are not known a priori. Okay, if you if you start from this instant and look forward in time, you can only see where it is being destroyed. To know where it is, where a given wrinkled, stretched, convoluted surface has been generated from, you have to look back in time. So, and looking back in time is non-trivial because this, the governing equations that define to, with this kind of situation, uh, momentum, uh, energy, species, uh, they do not obey time reversal symmetry. So you have to do some reconstruction algorithms to basically find out where the surface generated from. But anyways, so what are the formal objectives of this, uh, of this section? The formal objectives are where do the fully developed complete turbulent premix frame surfaces evolve from? What are the features, what are their special features? That is, what are the special features of these evolution locations or these generation locations? How do the flame surfaces generate and annihilate? What implication does generation and annihilation hold for the local flame series D? Actually, this has very serious implications and we'll see later. Okay. So uh, once again, we, as I told that uh, the turbulent premix flames, if you have to understand that, Often you have to look back into what has happened for laminar flame flames. It need not be one-to-one -one relation. It need not be that there is a one-to-one -one relationship, but often you build on uh, from those. Okay. So here we uh, take a look into Zendovich's theory of pilot points. So what are pilot points? 
Now remember that this, this uh, everything that is said here in this particular uh, chart is for laminar flames. Okay. So Zeldovich says that the pilot point in a non-stationary laminar flame, it's essentially a laminar flame, is the most forward lying point of the flame front in the direction of combustion propagations. The igniting impulse is transmitted from it to adjacent portions of the flame and so on until the flame front encompasses the entire mixture volume. Okay. So essentially in a laminar unsteady flame, the flame surface is being generated from this pilot point. And this has been shown uh, in non-uniform flow by uh, for laminar flames using the G equation by Yamato and Lewin also. So the concept of leading points is valid for laminar flames. Is the concept of leading points and its contribution towards surface generation valid for turbulent flames? So we'll look into that. How do you look into that? So as you see that we have basically discretized the finite temperature gradient uh, or, the, or the region of the finite temperature gradient into several isotherms, okay? And we have said that we can study turbulence flame interaction by studying flame, by studying interaction of turbulence with those isotherms. Let's have a finer grained approach. What makes those iso isotherms? Those isotherms are made, made, made by a large number of points, okay? And these points always reside on the flame surface. So we can define something like Based on Pope's uh, concept of surface points, we can define something called flame particles. Okay, so these flame particles are essentially points that co-move with the local flame surface. These are distinct from fluid particles. Fluid particles would pass through this flame surface along with the flow, but flame particles do not pass through the surface. They are always on the surface. They always reside on the surface because they co-move with the surface. They co-move with the local surface propagation velocity. What is the local surface propagation velocity? And that is equal to the vector sum of the local fluid velocity plus the local flame displacement speed times the local normal vector. So these are flame particles, okay? And they never leave the surface. So uh, the idea is that you, try, you, you slice up this flame into several surfaces and you, you then further refine the surfaces into several points and then you study the points. Okay. So now again, reflect the objective that we are going to study how from where does the surface evolve. So we need to do something called backward tracking. Uh, just to recap, the flame particles is essentially a class of surface points that move with the isoscalar surface within the flame. They provide spatiotemporal details of the specific regions of the flame. Ensemble of flame particles forms a flame surface and ensemble of flame surface forms a flame surface. So the flame particles is essentially the smallest unit or the, or the, or the most uh, refined description of a, of a flame uh, that you can have. Okay. Large number of flame particles forms a flame surface, large number of flame surface forms a premix flame. And you can always define a surface. Okay. As long as there is a finite temperature gradient, uh, you can always define a surface. The surface can be continuous, it can be broken, it can be distorted, it can be folded but one can always define a local surface as long as you have a gradient of the local scale. Okay, so first you do DNS of statistically planar flames, then you basically save the snapshots of the DNS at finite time intervals, and then you, the snapshots are fed into the backward flame particle tracking algorithm in the reverse order. Now this involves some detailed reconstruction. I'll not go into this, uh, this in details at all, uh, but uh, this is different from integration. It's more reconstruction. Uh, where you find out, uh, where you basically uh, find out the location of the flame particle at the previous time step. Okay, so here is the DNS details and the configurations that we're going to look at. So this represents uh, uh, statistically planar flames of hydrogen and mixtures at a given ratio 0.81, uh, which has detailed the hydrogen reaction mechanism. The way we do it is that we have a cuboid in which we have a planar flame and then we pre-compute isotopic turbulence, homogeneous isotopic turbulence in a box, and then we inject or push this uh, homogeneous isotopic turbulence uh, through this uh, inlet phase uh, into this uh, cuboid domain, and it interacts with this uh, planar flame, and it stretches wrinkles at a multitude of flame scales. So these are the these are the configurations: Reynolds number about thousand, Tamkolo number around two, Kalovich number of the order twenty, uh, between ten to twenty. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the, what we're going to look at. Now, uh, then 
we try to see where does the surface evolve from? What is the result of this backtracking? So we'll start with here, that if we have fully developed turbulent flame surfaces and we distribute the flame particles uniformly over the surface, okay? This is for the top row is for 350 Kelvin, the bottom row is for uh, 1100 Kelvin. So uh, we distribute these surfaces with uh, flame particles uniformly, and then we track them back in time. Okay. So this is initial time, intermediate time, final time. So we do a backtracking. And as we backtrack, we see that these uniformly distributed flame particles essentially cluster in these positively curved leading locations of the flame. Okay. So here is, and if you now play this forward in time, what you will see is, so what you will see is that these leading regions disperse and these come together, they come together to generate the complete surface. So it means that the flame surface at a later time evolves from these positively curved leading locations at an earlier time in the thin reaction zone regime. Okay. I mean, it's different from the laminar flame, widely different from the laminar flame, but still the insights that we glean from the laminar flame holds partial. There is no one leading point. There are multiple clusters of leading points. So that's the different that's different from what uh, Zeldovich was saying for uh, non-stationary laminar flames. But the leading point concept still holds here in a different manifestation. Okay, so now we can address uh, what are the special properties of these leading points. So these are the PDFs, okay? So this is the location PDF. The blue represents the PDF for the entire surface. The black represents the PDF for the those flame particles that got clustered in the leading points at different time intervals. So at the final time, of course, the black and the blue lines kind of uh, 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 basically merge with each other because at the final time, the all the flame particles basically uh, span the entire surface. So the the statistics of the of the flame particles at the finite at the final time and that of the entire surface are same, all right? But at the leading point, leading regions, when, they, when they're clustered at the leading regions, you can see that the PDFs, so this shows that they're indeed leading, okay? They're indeed at uh, the leading locations. X0 is the, is the tip of the, of the flame. So they have very small uh, X values at the leading regions. They also have very small flow speed, and that is why they are essentially the leading. Okay. It's almost as if the flow has, has stagnated, not exactly, but it's as if the flow has basically reduced uh, its speed in the leading regions. Okay. Your, your flow velocity is very small. And indeed, they're positively curved. Okay. And uh, there is no difference in tangential stretch rates, uh, strain rates in this leading regions. Okay. So these are the important properties that, that characterize these leading regions of the, uh, that generate the complete flame surface. Okay, so there is strong resemblance between the leading clusters of the flame particles and the concept of the leading point by Zeldovich and the co-workers, what they said for laminar flames. Now, how does the flame surface generate? The flame surface generates first if you look into the leading regions, the leading points are essentially clustered in the positively curved regions. And when the, when the surface is positively curved and it has a propagation speed, SD, then they are also positively stretched. So first, flame surface generation happens due to this stretch term. Okay. It's twice SD times mean curvature along the direction of the principal curvature. So first it happens because it just, it just uh, the flame surface is generated just due to the, due to the, the stretch caused by propagation and curvature. Now, next, turbulence takes over. Okay, so next in time, what happens is that the non-local, most extensive principal strain rate 
aligns with the surface tangent along the direction of the least curvature, but along the direction of the most principal tangential strain rate, and that results in tangential straining. All right, and then this kind of repeat, and then different of different segments of the flame surface basically join together to constitute the complete turbulent flame surface at the final time. So this is the mechanism by which uh, turbulence generates uh, the, the flame propagation and turbulence kind of works hand to hand. Of course, when this is happening, turbulence is also present. When this is happening, uh, flame propagation is also present, but these are the dominant mechanisms that we can, that we have quantitatively found out uh, that leads to the generation of the flame surface. All right. So, uh, uh, Next, what about uh, the dispersion characteristics? Uh, and how can we this compare with the dispersion of fluid particles in turbulence? Turns out they are quite similar. And uh, in this regime, both the set, the generation set and the destructing set, we can also define a set which got destroyed. Uh, the, uh, these blue particles, uh, which must have got destroyed to accommodate these black particles or this generating set at a final time. Uh, okay, uh, so we can analyze these both sets and how their dispersion characteristics looks like, and both of them essentially follow this t square law, which is expected from the fluid particles also in this domain. Okay, so that's what we see here. That this this uh, agrees quite well, uh, of course, with modified coefficients due to enhanced. Uh, 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 due to enhanced uh, uh, thermal diffusivity and also kinematic viscosity. Okay, so uh, it's, there's a kind of symmetrical process happening here. Both this set that generates the flame surface and both this set that destroys of the flame surface has kind of similar dispersion scaling laws, all right? And using this also, we can show that why it generates in the positive curve regions. Okay, it generates in the positive curve regions because under certain length scale, that is a Gibson scale, your it's a flame propagation that dominates. Okay. And when the flame propagation dominates, there is a tendency, and when you look back in time, there is a tendency for the flame particles to cluster only in the positively curved regions. So do you expect this to hold at all turbulent at, at all portions of the regime diagram? No, the answer is no. At very high ultra, color, ultra high Kalowitz number, we would expect this not to hold, but we have not done the study yet. So we can only say what we have seen that in, in Kalowitz number of the order 20, the flame surface is indeed generated from these leading locations. And it is generated by initially by uh, flame propagation due to curvature and then due to tangential straining due to turbulence. So what we have done here uh, as an interim summary, we have essentially looked into DNFs of statistical planar flames. We saved the DNS uh, snapshots at the finite time intervals. And then we fed the snapshots into the BFPT algorithm in the reverse order. From that, we find out what are the source locations of the turbulent flame surfaces. And they are essentially the leading positive leak of locations where the fluid velocity is also the lowest. Okay, so fully developed turbulent flame surfaces evolve from the multiple leading points, leading locations stretch due to this term, that is this uh, uh, propagation and curvature, uh, 2SDKM along the direction of the maximum curvature, tangential straining along the direction of the minimum curvature, first this, then this, and I'm not showing here, but we also can derive a relationship as Zanderwich said, between ST at a final time and a local ST at the initial time. And then flame particles disperse as per uh, modified bachelor's uh, scaling law. And dispersion is essentially due to flame propagation up to the Gibson scale, and then due to turbulence beyond the Gibson scale. And both actually has a T-square relationship. If we look into how flame particles will disperse purely by flame propagation that also has a T-square relationship. So that's why this fits in nicely. And uh, this is how essentially flame surfaces uh, develop 
in modern robotics. So uh, this is about uh, the 50 minutes uh, time and uh, we can take a, a short uh, break uh, for about uh, 10 minutes and uh, we'll reconvene at uh, 11, at one past 11. Okay. Oh yeah, uh, so I'm answering the question that since you already have the DNS time scale, time slices, why not drag the time, uh, points forward in time? Yes, we did this. And uh, this is also uh, uh, what these blue points are essentially tracked forward in time. And we'll, in the next sections also, we'll see what, uh, what, happens when, uh, what happens when we track them forward in time. So this set D, that is the set get, that gets destroyed uh, while you track them forward in time uh, also uh, has this relationship. And we first had did extensive work on uh, what happens when you track them forward in time. And we'll discuss them in the next uh, section also. Thanks for the question. Uh, can you track uh, flame particles from experimental data? So uh, to track the flame particles, you need the local flow velocity and the local flame speed and the local normal direction. Uh, it's hard to do it, but uh, with those information available, there is no reason why we can't do it. Uh, so on one hand, you need a lot of information. Uh, you need the flow velocity. Of course, you can get it from uh, time resolved tomographic PIV. SD is a little bit hard to get because we need to have the complete scalar field in three dimensions uh, as well as in time. And also the requirement is that you should be able to track them at very small time intervals. It typically, you need to track these Lagrangian flame particles at about one-tenth of the corner of time. So yes, it's possible, but uh, it's hard. Uh, typical cost of those simulations. I think we, we ran this on. Uh, so there are uh, there are two parts to this uh, to the cost. Uh, we first you have to do the DNS. That is the DNS was done about I think uh, we ran it on uh, thousand CPUs for about uh, twenty hours. So it's about twenty thousand uh, CPU hours, and then you have to save the data at very fine time intervals uh, uh, also. So, but that was done on a workstation with a large RAM. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, that is typically the cost. So the cost is the DNS as well as in terms of the post -process. Okay, can you explain why the leading concept is not valid for the regime with intense turbulence? Well, that is the expectation, okay? Uh, the, that is the expectation uh, that it will not be valid, but we don't know. Okay, somebody has to show it. The reason why, okay, the, the reason why, okay, to understand that why it should not be valid, you have to first address that why is it valid? The reason why it is valid is that, that if you track the particles back in time, like from here, from here to here, uh, they could have just collapsed anywhere, right? Uh, this from, we can, we can break it up loosely into two parts. That is from here to here, it happens due to turbulence training. And from here to here, it happens due to uh, flame propagation. Because initially it's propagating, it's, it's dispersing due to the curvature effects, right? So, uh, but the issue is that in intense uh, turbulence, in very large part of its number turbulence, uh, your, it is most likely 
that even in the earliest time scales, the flame particles will be dispersing not by flame propagation, but by turbulence effects. If that is so, then there is no reason that they sh the flame surfaces should be generated from only these positive leading regions. And the cutoff is essentially given by this Gibson scale. Okay, it scales as SLQ by turbulence kinetic energy distribution rate. So in large Scalovich number turbulence, this can be much greater than this when the Gibson scale essentially goes below the Kolmogorov of length scale. So in that regime, we expect it may not be valid. Okay. Okay, it's uh, okay. The flame particle tracking methodology is not really a numerical modeling method. It's more like you can think of it like a, a diagnostic, a computational diagnostic. Okay. So uh, the model is very simple. The model is only this. This is the model. And it is not, a, I mean, it's like an exact relation that governs the flame propagation velocity with the, uh, which connects the flame propagation velocity with the local flow velocity and the local flame displacement speed. Okay. So uh, this is not really a, a CFD model as such, but you can get immense insights. Okay. Uh, the corresponding model for the flame particle tracking will be the G equation. Okay, which is essentially a field equation that relies on this equation heavily. Okay, so the you, you do not use a flame particle tracking to replace any other modeling methods like uh, CMC, uh, FGM, all those things. Uh, but it is essentially a tool that can give you a lot of insights of the turbulence flame interaction that is happening. Okay, because each of these particles hold the entire history of the turbulence flame interaction. Okay.
All right. So uh, shall we proceed, Vishnu? Yes, Professor. All right. So uh, this section of the talk will uh, focus on local flame displacement speeds. And we'll talk both about uh, moderate as well as about intense turbulence. And <clears throat> as you know, the flame displacement speed is the speed with which a flame surface propagates locally relative to the local flow velocity in the direction of the local surface normal vector. So uh, in the previous uh, section, we looked uh, back in time uh, because we did not know a priori that which locations would generate the flame surface, okay? Now with that information available, we can just take everything forward in time and see where it goes. Okay? And that has some interesting implications that I will talk about. So uh, anyways, there can be two kinds of local flame speeds that you can define, one is the flame consumption speed that is based on the integrated fuel consumption rate, okay, uh, uh, integrated local fuel consumption rate. And then you can also define the flame displacement speed, which is the, the velocity with which the local surface propagates relative to the local fluid velocity in the local normal direction, okay. So this is how it. Now, as I was saying that uh, this uh, flame particle tracking equation is essentially the the, the, uh, the underpinning uh, equation that uh, for the G equation itself. So uh, just to recap, uh, though we will not really go into this, that uh, but a G equal to zero is a flame surface, G less than zero is a reactant, G greater than zero is a product. And uh, this is the, the configuration. And then if you use this multivariate Taylor's expansion uh, in the vicinity of GXT, uh, in the neighborhood of GXP, you can write it like in terms of the time derivatives as well as the spatial derivatives and including neglecting the higher order terms, you can arrive at this, this thing. Now this DX DT is essentially the local flame surface velocity. And then if you plug in this um, flame particle tracking equation into the G equation, of course, this was uh, derived long back. Uh, you can find it in Professor Williams book and you arrive at this thing, which is also the level set uh, method that people have, the computer scientists have developed. Okay, so uh, this is the equation. So you can clearly see that here, to, to, for this kind of modeling uh, of G equation, you need the local, you need to know the, what is the local flame displacement speed, okay? So uh, you need the information of uh, flame displacement speed uh, for uh, both the G equation modeling as well as the flame surface density type modeling. And of course, uh, as a uh, out of fundamental interest that the local flame displacement speed is a manifestation of the reactions and diffusion processes that occurs in a primitive flame. So you want to know about that. And also you can show that, that the, the, the local turbulent flame speed, if you define of an isotherm, it can be written exactly in this form. That is, uh, it is essentially the, the, the area, the surface integral of the density weighted local flame displacement speed. So you, there is a lot of reasons why you want to know how local flame displacement speed behaves at different points on the flame under the impact of turbulence. Okay, so a uh, turbulent flame is wrinkled, stretched at many length and time scales. And you can think of it as an ensemble of part of flamelets in certain regimes, of course. Okay. You can, uh, I think uh, these flamelets, uh, it will not behave as a flamelet in the broken reaction zone regime, but it, it behaves as a flamelet in, in, a large, uh, in a large portions of the regime type. And uh, part of flamelets are modeled using stretched laminar flame models. Okay. So where we believe that uh, the local flame displacement speed can be written uh, like a stretched laminar flame, including the, uh, the stretch effects due to tangential straining rate, as well as due to propagation and curvature. Now, is that true? So, we want to know how flames respond to strain and curvature effects in turbulence. So if you take this turbulent flame, and if you look and take this, uh, this, this arbitrary uh, location, which lands on this point uh, and uh, in this box, and you uh, shoot a normal vector and you extract the local flame structure, what you will see is that that the local flame structure, yes, it looks reasonably close to that of a laminar flame. 
This is about uh, in the thin reaction zone regime. Still, there is chances that it will look similar to the local uh, lamina field. And its chemical structure will also be similar. There can be regions where it can be broadened. There can be regions where it can be uh, interacting. But there are chances it, it can look like this. So of course, in these regimes, you can expect that uh, the part of the uh, flamelet model or the stretch flamelet model will hold. But is it always true? So just we'll take a brief uh, overview of the modeling efforts for uh, laminar flames. Now, the first laminar flame model used was, of course, by Darius Landau, where they assumed that the local flame displacement speed is equal to, uh, uh, is essentially equal to SL at each point on the flame. And this was used to essentially discover the stability of flame flames. Then Markstein in 1960 said, uh, the flame uh, speed uh, can be modulated due to curvature effects, okay? And he proposed a constant. And then there has been a huge number of analysis, very important ones, asymptotic analysis uh, by uh, Matalon, uh, by Clavin, uh, integral analysis by uh, Chuman Law, and uh, uh, by Goy and uh, uh, Bonkamp. So, and all this analysis uh, proposed, uh, some of these were linear models of uh, flame speed with stretch rate, some of them were nonlinear models. Uh, but essentially what came out was that, that the flame speed is modified by stretch rates and the, the stretch sensitivity parameter is essentially called the maximum length, whereas this key is a stretch rate. Okay. Now, the recently it has been suggested that uh, there are two maximum lengths actually, uh, one due to stretch rate and one due to curvature. Now this is, emerges from Bechtold's work and later by uh, uh, by Clavin uh, and Grana Autoros work also. Okay, uh, so this is the recent understanding that, uh, that the local flame displacement speed is equal to SL minus uh, a stretch mark steel length times the stretch rate minus a curvature mark steel length times the unstretched laminar flame speed times curvature. Okay, so there are two marks lengths. And in a spherical flame, essentially these two collapse into one maximum length. So in the spherical flame, you cannot distinguish between these two maximum lengths. Now, local flame speed in turbulence. Well, uh, if you look into a plot like this, what you see is you scatter. Okay, so if you plot the local flame displacement speed by the unstretched planar laminar flame speed as a function of the stretch Carlovitz number, note that this is different from the turbulent Carlovitz number that we defined earlier. This is uh, the non-dimensionalizing stretch. If you write in terms of the stretch color of somebody, it's a huge scatter. Okay. Uh, it can go off the order of 80. A large part of it is contributed by the density ratios also, but irrespective of that, there's a really, can't say much about this. So, and this happens due to this flame turbulence interaction. So what is going on? Okay. Why stretch, uh, why is the flame switch scattered like this? Can we, use laminar flame theory to explain this. So a brief review of the literature. This was, I think, first observed by Chen and Nim in uh, very important works in the uh, 1998, 2000. And they observed that the wide distribution of flame speed in turbulence. Okay. Uh, Hawks and Chen said that steady or small curvature models are unlikely to be successful for modeling the stretch response of a premix flame. Uh, Chakraborty et al. said that there remains a need to model the curvature uh, response of the combined reaction and normal diffusion components of the SD to account for the properly, uh, to account properly for the curvature uh, stretch effects. Okay, so you can, at the SD, you can also think of it as the right-hand side of the, uh, of the temperature of a scalar equation uh, normalized uh, divided by the mod gradient of that skill. Okay, so in that, of course, you have the diffusion terms and the reaction terms, and that is what he's saying, talking about here. That we need to know individual responses of these terms uh, under the effect of stretch curvature. And recently, uh, Metal highlighted that the need to have the need to understand the greater expressions of local SD questioning the validity of the stretch rate and uh, flame speed uh, relations based on laminar flame theory. Okay. So once again, we look into the DNS that we conducted. 
of statistically planar hydrogen air flames and uh, detailed reaction mechanism, uh, turbulence uh, pushed in, isotopic turbulence pushed in with a mean flow that goes on to uh, interact with the, with the flame. Okay. And once again, these two configurations, uh, Reynolds number close to 1000, uh, Karlovitz number uh, 1380. So now what we do is the following, as one of the patients said that, why don't we do forward tracking? Yes, that's what we do here. We do purely forward tracking, starting from the generating locations of the flame surface. Okay. So these were the generating locations of the flame surface. So we track these particles forward in time, they disperse, they span the full surface, and then they once again cluster to annihilate in these trailing locations, which essentially self annihilate uh, due to propagation. Okay, so that is the full life history of the of a turbulent of a flame element under the influence of turbulence. You, you know, if it is a Planar flame, if it is a standard laminar flame, flame, nothing of this would have happened. It would have survived for infinite time. But in turbulence, these flame elements, they generate, they stretch, they span the over complete surface, and then they annihilate in the strain modes. Okay. Now, this also provides us this, this kind of a, uh, availability of the time history from its generating locations to the annihilating locations also provides us an opportunity to inspect these flame particles from their birth to their death. We have the complete life history of these flame particles available. Therefore, if you do this, that is what we did here is that we started with the final, with, uh, with any arbitrary time, we uniformly distributed these flame particles over the entire surface. And then we backtrack these particles into these clusters of this leading, which clustered in the leading regions of the flame. And then we forward tracked it from these generating locations to these trailing locations. Okay, so we can roughly say that any flame state essentially should lie between this TI and TIE of some flame particle. If you have a large number of flame particles. Therefore, if we study a large number of flame particles over their complete lifetime, that is from their generation to annihilation and record all their states, we essentially generate a manifold of states which can represent any possible state realizable from the turbulent flame, given the inlet and the ambient conditions the same. All right. So with this uh, information available, let's look into what happens at for the displacement flame speed. So if we, uh, so now on the y-axis you have the, uh, we have the, and the flame displacement speed, uh, density weighted flame displacement speed normalized by the unstretched planar laminar flame speed for individual particles, which are given by these thin lines, and also for the average, this entire set of flame particles that we generate. And we plot it in terms of normalized time. T equal to zero means the start of the simulation when they're clustered in the generating locations when they're clustered in the leading locations, this T normalized by, by their lifetime, that equal to one means when they annihilate in the trailing locations. So what we see is that, that for all these isotherms, 350, 65, 1, that yes, the flame, uh, the flame speed uh, oscillates around the SD by SL equal to one, or SD tilde, that is the density weighted flame speed by uh, the answer span of the flame speed equal to one, and then it, it oscillates in the neighborhood of one for the most part of their lifetime until about 0.8. And then at the end of their lifetime, they just shoots up, okay? And the shooting up is even larger for the higher temperature isotopes, okay? So, and this is, this is, happens for all flame particles. Okay. That is, between zero to 0.8 of the lifetime, okay, uh, they, they fluctuate in the neighborhood of one and from near the end of the lifetime as the flame particles annihilate in these trailing regions, their normalized density weighted flame speed shoots up uh, 
much larger than one. The factor of four, it can be factor of four times larger than one. So, uh, of course, this tells us one thing that the stretch rate theories, they are based on weak stretch models. Okay? They do not typically work at uh, when the stretch rates are very high or when the, the flame speeds are uh, much away from their planar laminar counterparts. Okay. So immediately, based on that, we can distinguish, we can, we can differentiate the entire lifetime of flame particles into two phases, phase one and phase two. The phase one, that is from zero to 0.8, we can say that, yes, the variations of in the, the density weighted local flame speed are mild and gradual. And in the phase two, that is from 0.8 to about one, this is, 0.8 is a rough number. Okay? And uh, the variations between in, in, in density weighted flame speeds are large and rustic. Okay. So uh, then we will see at least first in phase one, whether the two Markstein length weak stretch models are valid first. Okay. So uh, first for that, this is the two parameter Markstein length model uh, SD tilde at any point in the isotherm is equal to the planar laminar flame speed, stretch Markstein length at that isotherm, curvature Markstein length at that isotherm times this integral. So this is the full definition of stretch. Okay. Uh, but now you see in the full definition of stretch, you have the SD in the right hand side itself. So, uh, and based on the asymptotic stretch rate limit where you can neglect essentially the, the dilatation term, you can arrive at this definition or as well as a, with a, another form of the stretch rate limit, you can simplify this SD into a, something like a, a, the temperature ratio times the planar laminar flame speed times curvature. So there are different definitions of stretch rates we can use and check whether these, this relationship holds in the <clears throat> first phase of the, uh, of the SD tilde with a cell. And this is the stretch marks length definition that you can find here. And this is the curvature marks length. Of course, you can see that the stretch marks length depends on the effective Lewis numbers and which number also. So, and these are the parameters that we extracted based on the global definitions, because you need to extract the global Lewis number, you need to extract global cell which numbers uh, for this. So, so what do we see here? So these are for different, three different arbitrary particles, particle I, J, K. <clears throat> Once again, we plot it in terms of, <clears throat> uh, that is in terms of, uh, uh, T by tau alpha in the first phase where the variation is not much from the SD by SL equal to one. So between zero and 0.8, we see that yes, uh, this black line is the DNS and these green, red and the blue are the basically the models, okay? Based on different stretch rate definition. So this is based on the full stretch definition. This is based on the asymptotic stretch definition. This is based on the modified stretch definition where you, you replace the SD with SL times uh, temperature ratios for the isotope. So you see that in this part, in this 0 to 0.8, all these lines actually capture this um, behavior of the, of the that we get from the DNS quite well. The green captures it best where you have the full definition of stretch and the red and blue are also not too bad. And this is for both the cases, the L and H, which are different Reynolds numbers, we see the same here. This, I mean, it looks like these are large variations, but they're not because this is here we have one and these are variations in about one. So this mild variations, but they're nature of the variations is very nicely and quantitatively captured by this stretch rate flame model, the two marks in length stretch rate model. Okay. But what about the last part? So that we can find out from the error estimates. If we see the error, we see that from zero to 0.8, the error is about 
20% for the asymptotic stage definition and less about 10% for the other definition. But in the last part, that is from the final phase of the flame particles where it was getting annihilated between 0.8 and 1, the error shoots up to about 200%. So clearly, uh, the weak stretch rate model does not work when the flame particles are getting annihilated in the last phase of the flame particles. What's happening? Now, if you look into the joint PDFs of uh, flame speed and stretch rate also, you can see that when the stretch rates are small, this uh, two parameter maximum length model actually describes it nicely. But when the stretch rate becomes large and negative, that is near the end of the lifetime, it does not work so well. Okay. So where do the flame particles get annihilated? The flame particles get annihilated in, in, in things like this. When these two kind of, when, when, a, when a reactant pocket is essentially formed and uh, the isotherms comes and basically collides on each other. This is in it is in these locations the flame particles get annihilated, and it is in these locations where essentially the model, the two stretch rate model is failing. Whereas in the rest of the things, you see that the uh, in the rest of the flame, the the flame even in this time three time steps, the flame is not moving too much. Whereas here the events are happening at a very fast rate. It's happening of the order of like twenty five microseconds. In 25 microseconds, the rest of the flame barely moves, at least in this turbulent limit. Okay. So the, to go into this, we need to look into the flame structures. So if you take this flame structure from this mildly curved uh, location, if we shoot a normal and plot the flame structure, what we see is that the flame structure is close to that of a laminar flame. A nice uh, thermal structure, nice chemical structure. Whereas if we extract a location from here and shoot a normal in the direction of the, uh, we shoot a normal, uh, then and extract the flame, the thermal and the chemical structures, what we see is something like this. Okay. Where essentially this, another surface is coming and impinging on itself. Okay. So, Indeed, the, the stretch rate, flame stretch rate, or the flame speed models based on weak stretch rates is definitely not designed for this kind of configuration. It's designed for this kind of a configuration. Okay. But this is also ubiquitous in turbulence. This kind of interactions among the surface interactions among the entire flame itself or the interactions among the individual surfaces. So we need to have a model for that. So for that, we developed this unsteady uh, cylindrical propagating uh, flames. I mean, there has been previous works on this, for the planar flame collision and also for spherical flame collision, but none of the works are absolutely complete in the sense that uh, it's hard to take into account density variations, uh, property variations for this kind of configuration. Okay. So we solved the, the, the temperature and the species equation, and <clears throat> we have a configuration where essentially the a flame, this is the inner reaction zone, this is the pH zone, is basically colliding and impinging into itself. Okay, it's imploding flame. Unlike a spherical expanding flame, which is propagating outwards into the unbound reactants, this flame is propagating inwards into itself. Okay. And from this, we try to extract how does the flame displacement speed behave. And for that, we uh, basically um, non-dimensionalized it and uh, used stretch coordinates and uh, analyzed the preheat zone, uh, extracting information from the reaction zone under the influence of uh, stretch. And from that, we came up with this uh, complicated uh, non-linear ODE and which actually simplifies in the limit of loose number equal to one to this rather simple uh, uh, expression where essentially you get the SD is equal to minus two alpha U kappa. Okay. So uh, this is what you get. 
at the end of this analysis. So of course, this is only valid when kappa is, is rather small. So you need to uh, put in, uh, to, to make it valid in the kappa equal to zero, you need to put in this in a cell term here in the front. So how does this work? How does this behave uh, and compare with the other, other models? So this, uh, this one, this equation three, is the two stretch Marston length model based for weakly stretched lamina flames. Whereas this one is this interaction flame model. Okay. And you see that it captures the trends reasonably well. Uh, whereas this goes to, to less than zero at very small uh, curvatures. Uh, this predicts this behavior quite well. And there is no reason for it to, and for the reasons that we have showed previously that in the large curvature response of the flame emerges from the fact that the flame is essentially colliding on itself. Where the flame structure is nowhere near to the laminar, the, the unstretched planar laminar flame structure. So there is also no reason why you, one should even apply the two Markstein length stretch rate models in those regions. Okay. It's an interacting flame. You cannot apply interacting, you cannot apply stretch rate models into an interacting flame as is. Okay. You have to consider the configuration where the where you are, where your flame is interacting itself, where the preheat zones are interacting. Okay. So it works reasonably well in this moderate turbulent conditions. So to summarize, uh, by analyzing these flame particles from the generation to the annihilating locations, you can find in, insights on the temporal insights um, of the local states of the flame. Okay. And you can essentially distinguish or differentiate into two states. One is the non interacting states, which are parted by the turbulent flow field. The flame structure, at least in this regime, is still close to a standard premix flame. And the variations in the normalized in, in the density weighted flame displacement speed are mild and gradual and close to SL. And in this regime, or in this region, the two-parameter Markstein length model is applicable. Okay. So this is the two parameter maximum model applicable for most part of the flame. But the flame also has interacting regions, which are perturbed not by stretch rate, but by flame flame interactions. And the local flame structure there is drastically different from that of a standard premix flame. And the variations in SD tilde, that is the density weighted flame speed are large and drastic and much, much, and it drives these numbers of flame speed much, much away from the unstretched planar laminar flame speed. And there, your interaction model is applicable. You can have a different interaction model, but you need to have some interaction model to describe those locations. And this is one such proposed model that we arrived at. Okay. So uh, this is, uh, for this part, and uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, I'll be happy to address before we move on to the next part. Okay. Uh, Tracking particles would tremendously increase the computational work and time. Can you tell us if this is the case or not? If it is the case, how do you decide number of density of the particles in the flame to keep the computational work manageable? Good question. So in this part, we do the flame particle tracking in a post-processing mode. We write the data at very fine time intervals, and then you basically do back tracking or forward tracking. You can do the forward tracking on the fly also, yes, and that will in, in, increase the computation time, uh, but you cannot do the for backward tracking on the fly. 
you need to have all the snapshots available to do backward tracking. So yes, this is computationally ex expensive, but as you see here, we can get very interesting causal insights of what drives something, okay? Which you may not be able to generate by looking at the joint PDFs of the two properties. Like for example, uh, if you just take a look into this PDF, it's hard to tell what is going on. This gives, this can give you a correlation. This does not give you causality. When you take things in time and you, you check what is interacting with what uh, to and how certain property evolves, you get that causal insight into what, uh, uh, when a particular phenomena is driven by certain things and not by certain other things. Okay, so in this particular case, for example, we can see by doing this flame particle tracking in poro time, we can see that this flame speed is, is driven to very large values because of the interaction in these trailing regions where the flame particles are here. Once it is known, now you can go back and do this joint PDFs and then try to correlate as we have done here. But without that, it's hard to know what is driven, what is what is driving this kind of phenomenon. Okay. So this was for uh, uh, moderately. Uh, turbulent uh, flames. Okay, uh, just one second. My slides are visible? Uh, yes. Yes, okay. thanks, Vishnu. Oh, thanks, uh, Sambhuj. So, uh, in the next section, we are going to look into extreme turbulence, that is, high Carlovitz number of flame propagation and structure. Now, if you just recall the regime diagrams, then uh, it is expected that when the, it is expected that the preheat zone is thickened when your Carlowitz number is greater than one. The Carlowitz number with the preheat zone as the flame length scale. And uh, when it is, when the reaction Carlowitz number is greater than one, you expect the reaction zone to be broken as well. So there are other regime diagrams too. <clears throat> now, this was not really measured. Okay. So, uh, in this series of papers uh, from Driscoll's group, they set out to measure the regime diagram. And they did it based on this highlight Bunsen flames, with, uh, which was subjected to very high levels of E prime RMS caused by impinging jets. Okay? And you have the uh, reactants coming here, you have the Bunsen flame like this, and you have a hot core flow on the sides to protect it to protect the flame basically from the air entrainment. <clears throat> Sorry. And these are the gas temperatures, formaldehyde. Uh, formaldehyde is a good uh, indicator of the preheat zone thickness. You have got OH also. Now OH uh, peaks due to your chain branching reactions inside the reaction zone because H plus uh, O2 goes to OH plus O. So OH is always a good tracker, but the problem with OH is that it survives in your product regions also. So uh, you have to combine it with formaldehyde to find out the locations of the reaction zone. So OH and formaldehyde flip gives you nice indications of where your heat release, your, your heat release locations. And also CH gives you nice uh, locations of your, uh, nice, nice uh, ideas of your, where your reaction zones. And what they find is that, it's pretty interesting that uh, these black, Filled regions represent uh, thickened flames, whereas these unfilled regions represent uh, 
not thickened flames. And instead of this red line, the expected boundary or, or this these lines, that is uh, this, this Karlovich number uh, equal to one line, they find that the, the thickening boundaries demarcated by is, is indicated by this Reynolds number equal to something 2,800. Now, why Reynolds number? The Reynolds number, because the Reynolds number is essentially proportional to your turbulent diffusivity. So they are suggesting that uh, it is turbulent diffusivity and not essentially Kalovitz number that is driving the flame thickening. Okay. But uh, you have to also recognize that this is not essentially like a freely propagating flame, which is uh, propagating into turbulent premix reactants. There can be inherent uh, interactions in the flame itself. But this is uh, one of the first measurements of uh, the regime uh, boundaries. And right now it is at odds with the established theory. And uh, of course, it is quite possible that turbulent diffusivity is driving these uh, uh, thickening also. And these are some of the very high Karlovitz number uh, DNS. And here you see that uh, what I was saying before that your uh, uh, your thickening of the reaction zone or the preheat zone is not only dependent on the regime diagram, but also can depend on the fuel structure and the fuel chemistry. For example, you see that for the same Karlovitz number 108, your methane flames are much less thickened than and distorted than this hydrogen flames itself. And that, that is shown up here in this. So in this regime, at least you can see that while the preheat zone is thickened, this is this is the reactants, this is the product. Sorry, my, one second. Uh, let me get that uh, spotlight. Okay. So uh, this is the reactants, uh, this is the product. So you see that here, there is thickening of your preheat zone, but your heat release zone is not much affected. Whereas this heat release zone is intact. Whereas here you can see that your heat release zone is thickened at Kalevich's number of about close to thousand. Okay. So uh, yeah, so these are some of the open research issues of uh, the flame structures in, in high Kalevich's number flames. Um, uh, and how, what is its uh, interact, how really the chemistry plays a role in this kind of intense turbulent flames. So this, this is an ongoing research. You can see that these papers are essentially from last couple of years. So it's a very active research topic. Now, we are going to look into also whether what we discussed before, flame speeds and the flame speed curvature relationships that we found, does it hold in uh, this kind of turbulent flames? Okay, so these are, this is data from uh, Professor Hongyam's group. And uh, these are the four configurations that uh, they looked at. So this is the F1 configuration where you have dump column number equal to one in the thin reaction zone regime. And this is colored by the local normalized flame displacement speed, normalized density weight of flame displacement speed. And you can see here that the, the flame speed peaks in this interacting very largely negative, very large negatively curved uh, regions or these regions with very high, very large negative curvature. Okay, so th these negative curvature regions essentially interact and drives of the of the of the flame speed. But what you what the difference here is that that in a high Karlovitz number flame, uh, the entire flame does not interact. In this in this large general number low Karlovitz number flame, that is this F one. The entire flame structure is essentially interacting with itself. Whereas in this large general number, large color of flame, that is F2, that is here, the flame structure is not interacting totally with itself to drive the flame speed. The isotherms are interacting among themselves, and these isotherms are essentially behaves disjointedly from the neighboring isotherms. And that's a large color of number effect. But does the relationship hold? So this is some of the new data. And you find that, uh, yes, uh, if you do a best fit, which is given by this blue line, and these are the models that these are the black lines, they uh, uh, agree with this best fit uh, reasonably well and different uh, isotopes. Okay, 
So uh, as and as you increase your as you increase your your uh, your your ISO temperature value is that is you go to deeper and deeper isotherms with larger temper at larger temperatures, you see that the the slope increases and that is due to the increase of the the density weighted thermal diffusivity in those isotherm locations. Okay, so uh, of course in this F two that is a high Calvin's number, high Calvin's number case, your uh, uh, scatter is much larger because now the collisions can happen both due to cylindrical due to cylindrical flame propagation due to planar flame collisions. Uh, as a result, you can have large flame speeds even at small curvatures, but predominantly the large flame speeds are essentially driven by very large curvatures uh, originating from the flame flame interactions. So that is the message here that the very large, it appears that the very large deviations of density weighted local flame displacement speed from their unstretched planar laminar value is driven by uh, flame flame interactions. In the low Calovitz number limit, that is in this regions, the large deviations are caused by interactions of the complete flame structure like this. Whereas in the high Calovitz number limit, it's the interactions of the individual flame structures or the individual isotherms that uh, drive these large density weighted flame speeds. But uh, this is what happens uh, for different Lewis numbers, for different fuels, at even larger Calvitz numbers that remains to be seen. Effect of pressure that remains to be seen. Okay. So uh, let's take a uh, 10 minutes break here because uh, next we will move into the, the final part that is the turbulent flame speed. And uh, we will uh, reconvene about in 10-15 uh, minutes. Let's, let's reconvene at about 12:58, uh, and in between, I'll be happy to address uh, any questions. Yeah, no, it's okay. Great. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, this far we have looked into how flame surfaces evolve, and then using the same tools, we uh, looked into uh, how the local flame displacement speed evolves accordingly, and we found that uh, the local flame displacement speed uh, can be described by the uh, by by basically application of uh, two different kind of models uh, for most part of the flame which is not interacting with itself uh, at least in the regimes we considered uh, the two parameter uh, weak stretch Markstein length model uh, works okay uh, but in the interacting regimes regimes uh, in the interacting regions where the flame is uh, collapsing onto itself uh, where the preheat zone structures interact. And in certain cases, the, the heat release reaction zones can also interact. Uh, there, of course, uh, you cannot apply the, uh, the weak stretch uh, model. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> you have to use certain kind of an interaction model uh, to describe the local flame speeds there. But uh, it is those locations which are less in frequency, but it is those locations which drives up your local flame displacement speed to a great extent. Okay, so uh, it is definitely of interest to uh, understand those uh, further. So let me get back to where we left. So we cover this and let's look into the turbulent flame speed. So once again, we now go back to the same picture of uh, flame interacting with turbulence. Now, um, the turbulent flame speed is essentially the global response of the flame under, as, a, as a result of this turbulence uh, flame interaction. 
Okay, so uh, you can define uh, the turbulent flame speed unambiguously uh, for even for a single isotherm also. And this is how you do it. So if you have the local uh, flame surface velocity, which is the sum of the local fluid velocity plus the displacement speeds times n vector. So the velocity of the flow relative to the flames propagation, the velocity of the flow relative to the flame surface is just minus sd times n cap. Okay. Now, what is the mass flow of premixed reactants into a flame surface? The mass flow of premixed reactants into a flame surface can be defined by m dot. I mean, this this uh, is common. It's just when you do an all transport theorem and you always use this to obtain the, the amount of mass flowing into a moving surface. So it's just uh, AT times density times the relative velocity of the flow, the relative velocity of the flow, the, the velocity of the flow relative to the local flame surface times the normal vector times integral over dA. Okay. And thus the mass flow of reactants into this surface, okay, of surface area AT is just nothing but rho times SD times normal vector times normal vector times dA. Okay. So if you define the M dot as rho U times ST for this particular isotherm times the area where the A is the projected area, okay, or the cross section area of this tuboid, then this holds, and you can write the STC not as one by A times integral over just SD tilde dA. Okay, whereas the SD tilde is nothing but the density weighted local flame displacement speed. So the turbulent flame speed of this particular isotherm can be defined by this exact relation of integral of SD tilde over dA. So we can see that there are two ingredients to it. Okay, one is the local flame speed, and another is the area. So if you have a complete idea of how this revolves in turbulence, we should be able to define a turbulent flame speed. This is, this is exact. I mean, there is nothing, no assumptions, no scaling, nothing here. So, but the issue is that, that this is not so straightforward. Even if you know SD tilde, the area and its relationship with SD tilde is not straightforward. Okay. Uh, so that, that's, an, that's what makes this whole uh, <clears throat> situation with turbulent flame speed rather complex. So, Don Kohler discussed two limiting cases, wrinkle flame rate regime and thin reaction zone regime essentially, which he termed as large scale turbulence and small scale turbulence. Okay. And turbulent flame propagation modes are fundamentally different in the two limiting cases according to him. When turbulent scales are larger than the flame thickness, then the turbulence increases the surface area. When turbulence scales are smaller than the flame thickness, turbulence modifies the transport process statistically, and we can expect that the molecular diffusion process inside the reactive diffusive flame structure is replaced by uh, turbulent diffusion of heat and mass. Okay. And of course, what you have to recognize the turbulence diffusion, there is really nothing called turbulence diffusion, it's a modeling concept where we model the, uh, the U prime C prime as uh, turbulent diffusivity times a mean scalar gradient, D mean CDD, D mean CDX, okay? Something like that. So uh, it's, an, it's, an, it's a little bit of an abstract concept of the turbulent diffusivity, but it has been useful in describing many uh, kind of uh, situations which involve scalar transport in turbulence. Uh, like be it pollutant transport uh, uh, or others, in, uh, development of a jet, of a turbulent jet, and so on and so forth. Okay. So the wrinkle flame net regime, the AT, if it, AT is the instantaneous flame area and A is the projected area, then uh, by using the similar relationships, we can show that uh, that for very weak turbulence, this kind of relationship should hold. Okay. But this is only for very weak turbulence and not for very strong turbulence, uh, especially in intense turbulence, large columns in the regimes. So there has been a huge number of, uh, huge body of literature on this and uh, uh, whatever uh, Peter said in this book uh, in 2000, that one of the most important unresolved problems in Phoenix turbulent combustion is determining the turbulent burning velocity. I mean, there has been a lot of more, 
other works uh, with a lot of experiments, uh, modeling simulations, but still we do not uh, comprehensively um, uh, understand uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, we do not comprehensively have a theory that describes uh, turbulent flowing speed unambiguously. Okay. Uh, so that is still lacking. Uh, I'll not go into this different uh, literature, uh, but I mean, it's, uh, so, okay. I'll just uh, see that there is a question that has been popped up. So, okay, <clears throat> as it is quite tricky, the question is the following. Uh, as it is quite tricky to estimate the turbulent flame speed, how does the velocity, how is the velocity of the inlet boundary defined to achieve a flame which does not move out of the domain? Yes. That is always tricky. So if you do not know, I mean, in the simulations, what we are doing, you have to prescribe a mean flow velocity. And to keep the flame statistically stationary, the mean flow velocity should be equal to the turbulent flame speed. But you do not know the turbulent flame speed a priori. So it's a bit of trial and error. Okay. So you try with some way to increase slowly the mean flow velocity starting from the planar level of flame speed. And at certain point, it stabilizes and you take that as the final mean flow velocity. So yes, that's tricky indeed. Okay. So uh, now <clears throat> this is the expression that Damkolo derived. And uh, ironically, it is still one of the finest expression that uh, probably describes experimental data. Okay, so that's the, the way the derivation goes like the following that you can write the standard planar laminar flame speed as it scales as essentially your uh, thermal diffusivity divided by a chemical time scale. Okay. Uh, chemical time scale, this is inverse of the reaction. So you know that the, the burning flux, if not, that scales as square root of our thermal diffusivity times the, the reaction rate. And if we write the reaction time scale as the inverse of the reaction rate, then we can write this expression. And by analogy, in the thin reaction zone, what we can do is that we can write, we can just say that, that this, what happens in the thin reaction zone is that because the reaction zone has, is remain, has remained unaffected, we can just replace this thermal diffusivity, which is a molecular molecular thermal diffusivity essentially with the turbulent thermal diffusivity okay whereas we can keep this chemical time scale identical to the chemical time scale that we encounter in the laminar flame so if we do that we can just write the ratio of the st by sl as a ratio of the square root of thermal diffusivity to the uh, turbulent thermal diffusivity to the actual thermal diffusivity and we can write down the turbulent diffusivity as u prime times L naught. Turbulent diffusivity as in units of meters squared per second to satisfy the units. And this is typically the definition also of thermal diffus uh, of turbulent diffusivity you can find in Landau Lipschitz's book. And if you use that, you plug in also the definition of thermal diffusivity as the ratio as it as the product of the flame p heat zone thickness to the uh, planar laminar flame speeds and you can write st by sl you get st by sl scales as uh, your ratio of <coughs> sorry uh, as the ratio of your uh, uh, your uh, turbulent diffusivity to uh, thermal diffusivity which scales as essentially square root of Reynolds sum this is remember from our previous discussions this is essentially uh, the Reynolds sum Okay, so in the uh, in a nutshell, st should scale as square root of e prime times e prime that is the RMS of fluctuating velocity to the uh, times the integral length scale and square root over that. Does it hold? We'll see. So uh, experiments, of course, there has been a wide range of experiments, uh, starting from those of Zeldovich and uh, even recent ones on uh, turbulent Bunsen flames. And this is not a recent one, but uh, this is uh, one of the most uh, prominent ones, which produce very important turbulent flame speed data for Bunsen flames at high pressure uh, from Kobayashi's group. 
And uh, so this is the setup where they pressurize this chamber. This is the Bunsen flame. Uh, and they do both uh, Schlerian as well as um, the mean scattering imaging, uh, as well as measure the velocities. And this is how uh, you can see the effect of pressure. So this is a Bunsen flame at, uh, at a low turbulence intensity at atmospheric pressure. But if you increase the pressure, there are two effects. If you increase the pressure, the, the flame thickness decreases and also your Kolmogorov length scale decreases. And also, of course, the reaction rates increase. But you can see that due to the two effects of decreasing flame thickness and decreasing um, Kolmogorov length scale, uh, the fine scales emerge uh, on this uh, on, on the flame surface. And uh, of course, uh, your Reynolds number has also increased due to the increase in density. So uh, this is, uh, you can see that uh, the surface area of this flame is much, much larger than the surface area of this left-hand side flame. And uh, the way you define the turbulent flame speed for this kind of flames is the following, that one extracts the, uh, by doing mean scattering, um, one can extract the flame uh, boundary uh, of the flame edge, and then uh, they can average it over, uh, over several realizations and from that they can find the location of the mean flame cone, okay? And from that, uh, you can define the ST as essentially E times sine theta by two, okay? And uh, from that, from measuring the, the inlet velocity, one can define and measuring this flame angle, one can measure the flame, turbulent flame speed. And this is what they got, uh, uh, turbulent flame speed is a function of E prime by SL. Of course, you see that uh, E prime by SL alone is not able to collapse the data for different pressures. And there is a, the, which suggests that there is, must be an effect of the length scale ratio, that is the integral length scale to the flame thickness also, that is involved in this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of situations. Okay. So uh, then I'll go into this uh, uh, spherical flame experiments, which has been also very useful uh, in measuring turbulent flame speed. There has been plenty of work by a Bradley's group at Leeds, uh, which uh, measured the turbulent flame speed over, uh, over, over several decades. Uh, here we'll present the data that is uh, available from this uh, dual chamber high pressure turbulent combustion vessel at, at uh, Princeton. So uh, this is a kind of a unique uh, uh, flame bomb experiment because here the entire propagation of the flame occurs at constant pressure. Now, how do you ensure that? Now, that is ensured by this dual chamber uh, uh, configuration. So uh, this, this, this uh, experiment of this, uh, of this facility has two concentric uh, cylinders. And uh, so you fill up the inner cylinder with the premix reactants and the outer cylinder with nitrogen. And uh, at the moment of ignition, the inner cylinder can communicate with the outer cylinder because the series of holes line up, okay? And uh, as the flame propagates, the increased pressure uh, is essentially absorbed by the outer cylinder. As a result, the entire flame propagation event occurs in isobaric conditions. And that is really important because as you know, uh, the the flame speed is strongly affected by pressure. So local flame speed, like uh, local laminar flame speed is strongly affected by pressure. And of course, the local flame structure and turbulent flame speed is also strongly affected by pressure. So it is useful to keep the pressure constants. In other chambers, what they do is that they just only take a small uh, section uh, or a small uh, radius of the flame propagation data where the pressure can be accepted to remain constant. So in this case, you can take the uh, entire uh, domain of flame propagation data with the And then you do Schlerian to uh, measure the uh, uh, measure the outer flame radius, uh, get an average out of that based on the enclosed area. And from that, uh, you find out the average radius. And from that, you find out the DRTT. So this is the experimental setup, the dual chamber design, constant pressure, it can go up to 25 atmosphere. Uh, we can do experiments up to 25 atmosphere and there are four fans which uh, generate uh, something close to isotopic turbulence in this inner chamber. And you have a, a Markali lamp and a Schlerian system that captures uh, the, the flame propagation event. 
okay and the high speed Schlieri imaging is the thing we perform and this is the the false colored uh, Schlieri imaging uh, for a, a given flame propagation event so uh, the flame uh, gets uh, wrinkled by turbulence and it propagates and uh, it fills up the entire volume so in between the ignition and the flame propagation when it fills up the entire volume we can extract the average flame radius based on the enclosed area by pi and square root of that and can find out how the, the average radius changes with time. Now, before uh, we do that, as this is shown here, and some um, visualization of the what kind of flame structures we see. So this is at uh, the top row represents the data at one atmosphere, at, but with increasing URMS. Okay, so from here to here, the RMS increases by double. You can see that as the RMS increases, the Reynolds number increases, the turbulence Reynolds number increases, and the finer scales emerge on the flame on the flame surface. Of course, uh, when the pressure is five times high, then the finer scales become even even finer, and uh, you can this this you can see that ultra fine structures emerge. And uh, but in all these cases, if you do ensemble averaging over these instantaneous realizations. Uh, these uh, these random structures that uh, that that of the flame that we find uh, basically leads to a leads to a <clears throat> circles, and from that and that allows us to basically have a meaningful definition of an average flame radius. If this different realization should not give any uh, symmetric circle, then there's no way you can use the flame radius as a characteristic length scale. Okay. So uh, this is how the flame propagates in time. So the kernel develops, and um, as you see that as it develops, there are finer, there are further structures that emerge on this uh, flame surfaces. Okay. And these are data for uh, methane and flame at equivalence ratio 0.9, which corresponds to Lewis number equal to one. And so this was the flame radius, but you need to also characterize the turbulence, and this is how you do it. We do kilohertz of PIV in the inside the chamber. And first step is to obtain the mean scattering images. So these are the mean scattering. And then you find out the velocity vectors through the PIV algorithm. And you can find the, the URMS uh, also. And you can define a new RMS that is on the flame uh, surface, and uh, which will actually increase with time as the flame as the flame uh, radius increases. So, uh, anyways, coming back to the Schrödinger images, uh, if you plot the average radius, where the average radius is defined as square root over a over pi, square root over a by pi, whereas a is the enclosed uh, is the is area enclosed by the Schrödinger edge. And if you plot that average flame radius versus time, so the green is the laminar case. It's nearly linear because uh, Lewis number equal to one uh, is uh, really the flame speed and the, and the radius, uh, the flame speed does not change with time. Okay, it's unaffected by stretch rate. So, average radius is linear with time. Whereas in the turbulent cases, you can see that the average radius is basically becomes concave upward with time. So which means that your DRDT is not constant or D average RDT is not constant, but it increases with time, okay? And that is very, of course, very interesting because it means that the, on average, the flame is accelerating. Larger radius, larger flames, uh, DRDD, larger flame speed. Mm -hmm. So then how do you explain such an acceleration? Now, if you go back to, one way to do it is if you go back to Dan Kuro's, uh, definition of uh, how he obtained this uh, ratio of the turbulent flame speed to the laminar flame speed, it was essentially the ratio of turbulent diffusivity to uh, thermal diffusivity. 
Now, the turbulent diffusivity, you can define it as a, define a scale dependent turbulent diffusivity. Okay, so as the flame grows, its flame brush also goes, grows. So there is no reason that the flame experiences same turbulent diffusivity at all times. Okay, as the flame brush grows, so we can define the, the relative, the, the relevant length scale is essentially your flame radius. So the way to define the turbulent diffusivity here should be the U prime, uh, which is conditioned on the flame radius itself, times the flame radius. Okay, and your thermal diffusivity, of course, stays as is. And now, if you plug this in, then ST by SL just becomes square root over U prime times average radius divided by SL times the flame thickness. So that's why now we can see that uh, Y ST becomes immediately a proportional to square root over R. Now, so this can we can use this to define a new Reynolds number, okay, uh, uh, to uh, which is dependent not on the integral length scale but on the flame radius itself. Okay. And uh, we can see how the scaling looks like. In this paper, of course, we did not uh, do this uh, analysis. We did this in the area, but this appears simpler and uh, more intuitive. So that's why I present here. Uh, anyways, what we see here is that for different pressure, pressure of one bar, two bar, three bar, five bar, and a different URMS. So this uh, relationship of U prime by SL times average R by delta L uh, works pretty well, okay? When you, on the y-axis, you plot the normalized DRDT, the DRDT normalized by the bond laminar flame speed. And on the x-axis, you have the U prime RMS, which is a function of R times the, by SL times the average radius by delta L, which is essentially, a, we can define it as a flame Reynolds number, okay? Which is defined, in, defined on the length scale of the flame. Now, of course, this should hold only when the, the average flame radius is, is not uh, larger than the largest length scales of the flow itself, because the largest length scales of the, is the length scales of the flow. That is what is imparting turbulent diffusivity into this. Uh, uh, and that is what is causing the, 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 the flame to accelerate. Okay. Uh, now, the other way to think about it is that uh, the, the flame is can be affected only by those length scales that are smaller than the radius itself. Okay, if it is, if you have a flame kernel which is which is which interacts with a very large scale eddy, then what the eddy will do is just to convect the flame or to push around the flame in the flow. So the flame surface will not really feel the presence of that eddy itself. So the way the eddy can interact and cause perturbations on the flame surface is only if the size of the eddy is comparable or smaller with the size of the flame itself. Okay, so that is why this, another way to think why uh, this uh, DRDT should be uh, a function of R and why R should appear as a characteristic length scale in, the, in this x-axis. So these are the two explanations. One is, uh, uh, the turbulent one is the, the the turbulent diffusivity itself is a is a function of R average radius, and another is this uh, that uh, the, the perturbations on the flame surface can be affected only by those length scales which are equivalent or smaller than the radius of the flame itself. Okay. Uh, just one question somebody has asked that on um, slide 71, could you please elaborate on the laser direction? Are you looking towards the flame from the front or are you looking at it from the top? Okay. Uh, okay, so in this case, the laser is passing from here. Okay, so it's, it's the laser is passing through the sides so the, the window is designed such that it has a, it has a plano convex lens, which expands the laser beam. Uh, uh, it, sorry, a plano concave lens, which expands the laser beam. And uh, then you visualize the, the laser sheet. Uh, the, the laser beam is expanded into a sheet and you visualize the laser sheet from one of these windows. The same window we use for Schlieder and imaging. So uh, yeah, we were discussing this, that is uh, the normalized uh, flame propagation rate uh, can be explained by this uh, Reynolds number where we find the scaling that this normalized flame propagation rate scales is essentially this 
claim a Reynolds number to the power of one half, close to one half. This is the scaling requirement. Okay. And now uh, this was for only methane flames, uh, but what if we do a large range of fuel, larger, larger range of turbulence intensity? So these are all the points. These points represents experiments we did. These data, these dots represents uh, experiments from Leeds um, uh, from the 2000, I think 2011 paper, CNF paper by Lois. Mm. And uh, uh, yeah, Lois et al. CNF 2012, sorry. And uh, now if you put all of them together, now this Lewis number is not equal to one, okay? So we see that, what we see here is that uh, the, the, those data with the same Lewis number essentially falls on single lines, but the data with different Lewis number does not fall on single line and they have different slopes, okay? So the Lewis number causes the flame speed uh, to change even if all of the parameters are same. So all of the parameters are same, meaning that if you have same turbulence intensity, same flame speed, same radius, same flame thickness, then you are on this particular point, then one with the larger Lewis number will have higher normalized turbulent flame speed. And this is what has been observed in other experiments as well. And so uh, we define this, uh, we use this Markstein length in this paper uh, to, to see that if we can collapse the data, and of course, one uh, uh, disadvantage with this kind of, uh, we, by inserting the Markstein length uh, into the scaling, though as you see it works reasonably well, is that the Markstein length can be negative also. So you cannot use this for negative Markstein length uh, data. You can only use it to explain the, uh, the positive Markstein length data. So, but still the, 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 the collapse is reasonably well, but uh, because of this uh, issue that this, uh, this, this problem is not yet closed, and there still remains to be understood that how to achieve a perfect uh, scaling using this uh, for negative Markstein length fuel and mixtures. Okay, what about other experiment? Uh, what about uh, the fact uh, that this we have collapsed these two different uh, non-dimensional parameters? Are these two parameters close to each other? The experimental data suggests that yes, they are close. That we have M and N uh, 0.42 and 0.45. If you do an independent fit of these two parameters. That is, if we do a surface fitting, we found those to be close to about 0.5, not exactly 0.5. Okay. Uh, other fuels, uh, uh, C24, C4 to CH normal alkanes. Now C4 to CH normal alkanes have kind of similar flame structures, kind of similar flame speeds. So uh, similar laminar flame speeds, but does turbulence cause any kind of difference? So if we take all these data, uh, this is for n hexane, and uh, we see that yes, indeed, n hexane also collapses reasonably well on this uh, definition of e prime times r divided by SLDL to the power 0.5, uh, and it collapses on this uh, uh, this state by by this Reynolds number to the power of half uh, uh, scaling uh, reasonably well. Okay. Uh, C2, C4 to C8 and alkanes, this is hexane, butane, pentane, octane. All of them kind of work, uh, collapses on this, uh, has this demonstrates this. Then also more to the word of half scaling, whereas the Reynolds number is based on the flame radius as the characteristic length scale, but it has the inherent Lewis number effect. That is, all other things being same with, with the Lewis number, with the smaller Lewis number, the normalized uh, turbulent flame speed is higher, okay? The smaller Lewis number has a higher normalized turbulent flame speed. This is visual, this is can be observed for n hexane, butane, octane, pentane also. Uh, once again, if we go back to other uh, data sets uh, from uh, this similar dual chamber bombs, uh, bomb experiments uh, for methane, uh, this is from Xi's group. Uh, we see that yes, this their data also collapses uh, perfectly well on this uh, Reynolds number, which is defined on radius. Okay, so this is uh, what we see. Uh, it has an exponent of about 0.54. We also propose this exponent of 0.54. Uh, uh, so this this uh, holds up in others other experiments too. Uh, from uh, who from Huang's group. If you see, uh, this is a blend of methane and hydrogen, and this uh, shows reasonably well. 
but still you have to see that this is uh, not fully closed this problem okay uh, you do not have a complete theoretical explanation of this um, this kind of skilling uh, yes you have you can explain it from stsm we did some theoretical analysis uh, uh, you can use you can arrive at it from down colors uh, turbulent diffusivity concepts but turbulent diffusivity as well as areas there are you have to you have to assume certain things that is okay we, we just assume that we replace alpha with turbulent diffusivity it's not really from first principles that you can arrive at this at the scalings at this theoretical scaling though it shows uh, from experience another issue is that whether this uh, st by sl and at by al this area ratio really holds in this okay we don't know it's hard to gather that information from uh, these expanding flames mm, uh, but uh, there are some recent DNS that have been performed, which can shed light in those kind of questions. And uh, the data from George JTEC, so this is a different setup. This is kind of like a wind tunnel filled with, with reactants uh, where they ignite and then the ignited kernel proceeds and the kernel basically expands. So their data also is not exact, but uh, reasonably close uh, to this, uh, to this uh, Reynolds sum to the bar of half. So, it seems that this Reynolds number to the power of half with the Reynolds number as the average radius, based on average radius, holds uh, in in different configurations. But uh, still, uh, there are open questions that needs to be resolved in this kind of uh, configuration. Like, how do you uh, discuss, explain the Lewis number effects? Uh, how do you arrive at the scaling from absolutely first principles? Uh, so these are the unsolved problems that remains to be addressed. And of course, the bigger unsolved problems would be that up to what radius does this hold? What is the maximum DRDT that can uh, be attained? Can this lead to detonation? Uh, we don't know. So there are different kinds of questions that remains to be addressed in this kind of uh, experience um, and this kind of uh, scales. And in, inherently, that there are other methods also needs to be explored because uh, the Schlerian imaging has its limitations it, and uh, the area the average radius that we extract, that also has this <clears throat> limitations on whether it's really representative of the average radius or not. So uh, there are different kinds of things that one can uh, address in this kind of configuration. But the message here is that it appears from different uh, data, from different studies over the past decade, that the, the, the normalized turbulent flame speed uh, obeys this kind of uh, uh, Reynolds number to the power of half scaling, uh, whereas the uh, Reynolds number is basically defined with the average radius as a characteristic length scales. Okay, at least when the in the in the in the thin reaction zone regime and beyond. Now, of course, if your if your uh, Carlovich number is extremely high, of the order of thousand, ten thousand, then you would expect the the flame structure to be uh, the heat release zone to be severely uh, deformed. And it should be a broken reaction zone regime where uh, the flame can extinguish, and uh, this kind of uh, flame propagation we may not be expected in those regimes. All right. So uh, next, uh, we'll just uh, move into the last lap of this uh, talk. Uh, we'll uh, we will with this kind of uh, scaling exponent for DRDT in place, that is, we have this uh, uh, DRDT is proportional to uh, R to the power of certain alpha, whereas this contributes to certain R to the power of alpha, and this contributes a major R to the power of half. Uh, we, can we use this to basically distinguish between uh, unstable, hydrodynamically unstable flames and purely turbulent flames? Okay. So uh, that is the question. So as you can see that this is a laminar flame with cellular instability, and this is a turbulent flame. Uh, of course, both has got uh, structures and scales, but uh, of course, this is much more fast accelerating than this one. Uh, this, is a, this has got a much faster acceleration than, than this itself. So, and, but, and we can expect that the exponents that is, if you if you write a relation like d average r dt is equal to a proportional to r to the power of alpha, you can expect this alpha to be much larger than this alpha. Okay, so using those alpha values, can you distinguish between different regimes of of flame propagation? Okay, and identify those regimes in which 
this will be dominant and I and distinguish it from those regimes when this is dominant. Okay. So uh, the way is that, uh, the way to do it is the following. That is, okay, if this is cellular instability dominated, this is turbulence dominated flame propagation. And uh, here the flame acceleration is due to, uh, due to uh, cellular instability. And here the flame actually acceleration is due to turbulence. Okay, so if you do a, a scaling analysis for Lewis number one and identify the conditions, then uh, you do the investigation uh, for you do the investigation for both Lewis number equal to one and Lewis number less than one, and find out the scaling exponents and these conditions. Okay, so we have established that uh, the average flame propagation rate scales is added to the power of half, whereas RETF is essentially U prime RMS times uh, average R divided by SL times delta L. Now, E prime RMS also scales as R to the power of 0.33. So the actual scaling of ST with R, which if you could define this as R by delta L, to the power of this exponent beta in turbulence, that is beta T, as what we obtain beta T to be about 0.67. Okay. So average R by delta L, we can define as a Peckler number. And it's, it's in, then the scaling relationship becomes ST average is essentially petal number to the power of beta T, whereas beta T is about 0.67. So in turbulence, your beta T is 0.67. This is in the thin reaction zone regime where uh, the the where there is absolutely no instability uh, deep into the thin reaction zone regime, and we can expect this scaling exponent to be 0.67. Okay. So once again, uh, did this experiments in uh, with high speed fluid imaging, and uh, if we do it for Darius Landau instability conditions, we see that uh, this is DRDT and this is average radius. So this is at one atmosphere when there is no flame acceleration, and then as the radius becomes larger, then the flame starts to accelerate. Okay, and at very high pressure, when the flame thickness is much smaller, much much smaller than the average radius, then there is exponent kind of saturates to a specific value. So this is how we can present the data. You can write this DRDT as a function of Peckler number, and you can show that between Peckler numbers zero to between ten to hundred, then the then your uh, the SLB is nearly constant with average radius, but beyond about hundred, then instability comes up, and then it saturates to an instable uh, to an unstable condition. Uh, where the Peckler number is about 0.35. Okay, so we can explain we can explain this by this three stage behavior. That is, this stage at small Peckler number is dominated by smooth expansion. In this intermediate stage, it is dominated by transitions from the smooth expansion to this uh, uh, turbulence uh, to this to this uh, fully uh, saturated regime. And this is the saturation uh, where you see that this exponent is is kind of approaching a constant value, this power loss scale. And this has got a slope of about uh, 0.3. It fluctuates between 0 0.3, 0 0.35 uh, around. So this is the acceleration exponent we can expect in fully unstable, fully hydrodynamic and unstable uh, conditions that is uh, promoted by this study as lambda instability. So this condition, we, if we represent this by beta c, we get beta C is almost about 0.3, okay? So remember in turbulence, your beta T, the scaling exponent with Peckler number was about 0.67. In here, your uh, scaling exponent is about 0.3. Okay. So uh, of course, if you have Lewis number less than one, your diffusion thermal instability also appears. And there is a three-stage behavior also exists. And the smaller Lewis number, you have got larger uh, flame, average flame propagation rate. And uh, in, the, in the saturation stage, your beta C is about 0.33, which is not too different from the beta C equal to 0.3 that we obtained. So for different Lewis numbers, your flame, average flame speed is different, but, your, uh, but, but the, the scaling exponents are not too different. That is the message here. So to summarize, Laminar flames, which are saturated with cellular instability, the final exponent that you get for the average propagation rate is 0.3, the number of 
the turbulent cellularly stable flame in the thin reaction is an energy. The scaling exponent that you get is for particular number, average R by delta L is 0.67. Okay. So now, how do you explain these things and form a regime diagram of it? Now, we develop this, uh, uh, this uh, regime boundary based on the following considerations. And we said that barrier cylinder instability develops in turbulence uh, if your if the Darius Landau instability growth rate is much, much larger than the turbulent AD frequency. Okay. Both has got times, both has got uh, dimensions of one per second. So this is the kind of situations where the Darius Landau instability and turbulence interacts. And we kind of establish a condition where one will win over the other. When will one win over, when will Darius Landau instability win over uh, perturbation flame surface uh, fluctuations that are generated by turbulence in the conditions when the Darius Landau instability growth rate is much, much larger than the turbulent KD frequency. So, based on that, uh, we can find out this Darius Landau growth rate uh, based on past analysis. And uh, of course, we can find out the turbulent KD frequency at a particular wavelength. Um, or a particular wave number k, okay? And then if we just compare them, we find we can establish this, this parameter beta. This is very different from the scaling exponent beta, by the way. And this beta equal to one line is given by this, by this beta equal to one condition is given by this black line. So anything below this black line, we expect it to be dominated by Barrier cylinder instability, and beyond this, we expect that it should be dominated by turbulence. Okay, so now with the availability of this thing, with the availability of the of the flame propagation rates, which is dominated by cellular instability, and the turbulent cellularly stable flames, which is dominated by turbulence, and with the availability of these exponents, at different conditions, we can test out whether this regime. Uh, uh, really mean something or not. So we can have three cases essentially, where your planar laminar flame speed is much larger than the RMS of fluctuating velocity. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. All right. So uh, here your, your Darius Landau instability can essentially dominate. That's what we find essentially in the ring through flamelet regime. Uh, next, we can have a case where your SL is essentially this, this case where that we are talking about this ring through flamelet regime where SL not is greater than URMS. So if the Lewis number is equal to one, and if you plot this average flame speeds with this in all number, we can find that that in this regime, the exponent is essentially equal to 0.27. Okay. And which uh, saturates to about 0.3 as we discussed uh, in the in the Peckler number between 100 to 1000. And this 0.3 is much, much lesser than, uh, is much lesser than this 0.67 exponent that is expected for uh, the turbulent flame speed. Okay. So in this regime, when SL naught greater than URMS, in this regime, you can see that it is purely Darius Landau instability that is dominating. All right. So SL not greater than URMS is pure dominated by Darius Landau instability. How do we know that? Because this exponent of Peckler number is much lesser than is half of the exponent that is expected in fully turbulent regimes. So Darius Landau instability dominates in the flame propagation, dominates the flame propagation in the wrinkle flame regime, almost in the entire flame wrinkle flame regime. When the when the when the length scale ratio is of the order of greater than about 50. Now uh, the Lewis number less than one. Also, we see that the exponent is slightly different, but not too different from uh, the you know, from the Lewis number equal to one case. 
4.37. So the cellular instability dominates in this regime for loose number less than one as well. Okay. So the, it's, it's, it's close. Now, in the wrinkle flamelet regime, that is when U prime is U prime eta is between uh, when the SL naught is between U prime eta and U RMS, then we find that the Darius Landau instability and turbulence interact and the new exponent will emerge. Okay. So here we see that the Reynolds number exponent is about 0.33 and the corresponding Peckler number exponent is about 0.43 in this regime. Okay. So this is the exponent that is, that is, uh, that is found here uh, in this kind of regime. So now we see that the turbulence is even further accelerating the, uh, the, the flame. But still in this regime, it is lower than the, the, the 0 0.67 exponent that we uh, found for pure turbulence. What about Lewis number less than one? It's, yeah, it's so once again, this Peckler number exponent is uh, close to, um, for the Lewis number equal to one, though the turbulent flame speed is, though the average flame speed is larger. And of course, in this case, when you're uh, in the thin reactions on regime, this turbulence dominates and thick and flame regime is found. And in this case, you found, you once again, go back to the pure turbulence case, where your scale says Reynolds number to the power of 0.5 or Peckler number to the power of 0.67. Okay, so this is a pure turbulence dominator regime. And for Lewis number less than one also, we find that yeah, the scaling exponent of 0.67 holds. And uh, though with uh, increasing Lewis number, the average flame speed reduces all of the conditions remaining same. Okay, so, uh, this can be summarized in this regime diagram along with the regime boundary that we obtained. So this beta essentially is the beta of the skinning exponent of the Peckler number. That is, if you write the average flame propagation rate, D average of DT is equal to Peckler number to the power of beta, okay? And do the experiments at different conditions as we did and put those different conditions on the regime diagram and color them with different beta. So the red corresponding to beta equal to 0.35, which means it's a purely Darius Landau insecurity dominated regime. Green is 0.44, it's the instability turbulence interaction regime. And the blue is the pure turbulence regime. We see that the pure instability dominated regimes is enclosed by this regime boundary. Okay. But just outside the regime boundary, it's not that the Darius Landau instability instantaneously vanishes. There is a regime, there is a transition regime where Darius Landau instability interacts with turbulence to give rise to a new scaling exponent of about 0.44. And then it transitions to a fully turbulent state where the scaling exponent is about 0.67. So yes, this uh, boundary is good to, uh, to basically identify conditions that are purely dominated by Darius Landau instability, but for pure turbulence dominated conditions, you have to find, go to the uh, uh, thin reaction zone region. So that is the message that uh, emerges from this. So once again, you see that uh, this is how we can connect the different uh, uh, aspects of the laminar flame structure and laminar flame propagation with the turbulence physics. And often something new emerges out of those interactions. Okay. But it is essential that we uh, develop good understanding of this is both fundamental underpinnings that uh, hold this entire field of turbulent premix combustion, uh, it's uh, turbulent premix flame structure and its dynamics. So in summary, uh, we can identify a regime diagram where uh, 
radius length of instability exists in turbulent flames. And that is essentially given by this kind of a boundary. And uh, we can have a revised regime diagram like this, whereas we also identify a state where the transitions uh, happens from the purely instability dominated state to the uh, to the to the pure turbulence dominated state. It's not abrupt, but there is a, another regime through which this transition happens. And the diffusional thermal instability in turbulent flames that influences the total burning rate, but does not influence the acceleration exponent. Okay, so uh, that's. Pretty much it. I don't think we can uh, really go into uh, flame stabilization in this talk. Um, maybe some other time. And uh, uh, if you have uh, questions, we can uh, go over them. And if you want me to discuss a few parts of the last uh, two and a half hours or more, we can go over that also. So thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to discuss this and happy to address any questions. Uh, are there also investigations on the border between instability turbulence interaction and the turbulence dominated? Yes, so these, you can find this here. So this is the case where Yeah, this is the this is essentially the border between the this is essentially the state which is the transition regime, okay, where we go from the scaling exponent of about 0 0.3, 0 0.3 to a scaling exponent of 0.43. Uh, I would believe that the scaling exponent should like should be more continuous, but that can be due to the small number of data points that we have access to. I believe I would like to believe that the scaling exponent continuously increases from about 0.3 to 0.67 in the fully turbulent state. But this is uh, where is the difference? This is essentially Young et al. Uh, Young et al. Um, in uh, CNF uh, 2018. Uh, sorry, I'm missing the reference at this stage, but just let me look over it. This paper and also this paper. This paper is the one that investigates this uh, transition regime uh, from the uh, fully Darius land or unstable state to the uh, to the fully turbulence dominated state. Okay, this Lewis number. When I mean unity Lewis number, it's essentially the effective Lewis number that is that we are uh, defining here. It's not for a particular species, it's the effective Lewis number. Uh, the way to calculate it is that uh, uh, is uh, you have a mixture average thermal diffusivity and the molecular diffusivity, you take it for the, for your, uh, for your, uh, for molecular diffusivity, take it, you take it as the, your, uh, as the molecular diffusivity of the uh, of the least abundant species with respect to the most abundant species. Okay, so that's how we define the effective Lewis number. Okay. Uh, Any other questions?
So this is uh, this kind of regimes are less explored, but uh, uh, it is it is this is pretty uh, interesting. And uh, uh, these experiments that they did, Young and Saha, these are quite interesting to basically identify the regimes uh, in which uh, instability dominance was systems where where pure turbulence effects dominate. So, um, and as you see that here in in small uh, length scale ratios. So in small length scale ratios, it appears that the that this regime is not in, not consequential, but here as your Reynolds number grows, this this line also grows. So uh, even if this if this length scale separation, that is the ratio of your integral length scale to your flame thickness, is very large, then you can have uh, you can have uh, various lines of instability even at fairly large p prime by SL of the order of ten. So that is the that is the takeaway message message here. Any other questions? Hi, Saha. Hi, Michael. Fantastic. Well, without any questions, I, you know, I hope everyone will join me in giving Professor Chattery a virtual round of applause you know, for, um, for, you know, it takes a lot of effort to put this together and to share it with you all. And uh, uh, I know everyone's very appreciative. So thank you, Sweto, for, uh, for, you. for taking the time to do it. Thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure and a great honor. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary. Yeah, uh, if you, I mean, if you think about this uh, to the students, if you think about this later, and if you uh, want to ask any questions, you, I mean, uh, you know, my, you can find just my email ID with the Google search and you can feel free to shoot an email and I'll be happy to answer them. So thank you again for your attention and uh, thanks a lot to all of you. Have a great uh, rest of the day and have a great weekend. Thanks, Shubhita. Yeah, it stopped recording. Okay.